to be here. I have um, uh, tried to minimize the number of slides, except as usual, I have too many slides. But uh, we have a small group, and uh, the purpose here, and my purpose as I see it, let me have that, that pointer, um, uh, is to talk about redox, this, this component here that's relevant to all aspects of thiol metabolism. And, um, what I'm going to do, uh, again, the, the most, I view the most important aspect of, of what I'm going to say is to try to impart my impression of redox, how it's useful, and what, what its importance may be in terms of uh, cell function. And what that means is that transmission of that concept of redox is more important than anything else here. So stop me at any point. Uh, if you have questions or want to uh, discuss any of the aspects. But the talk is organized uh, really just onto two aspects here. I'm not going to talk much about nutritional and therapeutic control. I decided that since the main discussion was NAC, then that's, that aspect is, is fairly evident, although there are some other potentially complementary approaches here. But I'm going to talk mainly about the, the meaning of redox uh, as we have deduced this from our studies on principally on glutathione redox in cells, cell culture, and some animal studies. And then the work that we've been doing over the past 10 years to try to use 
the measurements of glutathione redox as a, a clinical measure of oxidative stress. <clears throat> now, to begin with, our concepts of what we mean by oxidative stress really go back to free radical chemistry. And that is that uh, a variety of, uh, of biological systems as well as chemical reactions will result in generation of reactive oxygen species in the presence of trace metal ions generating a highly reactive species such as the hydroxyl radical. And these then are thought of as the main source of oxidative stress. It's an ongoing process in our bodies and uh, obviously uh, greatly exacerbated in certain disease processes. Now from beginning back in the 50s, there's an enormous literature that's accumulated on various uh, reactions with macromolecules. And the bottom line is that all macromolecules are subject to oxidative damage. But in that process of oxidative damage, not all of the steps are irreversible changes. In fact, there are a good spectrum of reactions that are fully biologically reversible. And these are particular ones in involving sulfur amino acids. Uh, the one that we usually uh, think of first is the oxidation of cysteine groups in proteins or in glutathione to disulfides. There are, however, other reversible oxidations, oxidation of cysteine residues in proteins to uh, sulfenic, sulfenic acid derivatives, fully reversible, involving only one cysteine instead of two cysteines, and also oxidation of the sulfur in methionine, the sulfoxidation. There are specific enzyme systems that will reduce uh, methionine sulfoxides back to methionine. So these are reversible reactions that occur along with all of those irreversible reactions in uh, oxidative stress. Aiden, is there uh, any evidence for an enzyme that uh, produces the sulfuric acid? As, as far as I know, there isn't. But these are thought to be, that, that structure is only stable in a pocket on a, on a protein. So it's where it's sequestered away from the aqueous environment. Under those conditions, probably a thiol, uh, uh, e probably either cysteine or glutathione, or maybe thioredoxin would function enzymatically uh, to, uh, or quasi-enzymatic reaction to reduce that sulfenic acid back to the thiol. But there is a highly competitive irreversible reaction to, to the sulfenic acid, at least for low molecular weight. To go further oxidation, right. So the thinking is that sulfenic acid probably exists only at specific sites on proteins. But for instance, in FOS and June and other transcription factors, that appears to be the, uh, the reversible oxidation that functions in, in either on or off uh, control. But that brings us to an important issue that has really developed over the last 10 years. And that is that these reversible reactions are not only involved in pathologic or toxicologic processes, but also that they are ones that biology has used in signal transduction and control. So what we have really over the past several years have recognized that we have been looking at the issue of oxidative stress as a pathologic process. And now we have to cope with the reality that this is probably a central signaling and metabolic control process that's buried within that oxidative stress. And this is what we really have to distinguish then is in our thinking and in our experimentation is how we can discriminate between changes that are really pathologic irreversible reactions versus perturbations of normal signaling and control mechanisms. And that's where we get into the, to the redox and that's why uh, we, we have really focused on this. Now, the, the central issue here then is that in terms of if you just eliminate your thinking about that free radical type of reaction and the irreversible damage, what we can recognize is that simply thiol disulfide changes 
can affect enzyme activities, tran enzyme activities and transporters, activity of transcription factors, can control generalized processes such as cell proliferation, and also activation and execution of apoptosis. So this thiol disulfide then is of central importance in toxicologic processes, but probably also in, in regulation of cell functions. So about 10 years ago, we began to think in terms of the use of, of glutathione as a way to provide us with an indicator of the, uh, the changes in the redox state. Now, the, the main motivating factor here uh, that motivated me to begin to think about this was that there, at that time there were hundreds of papers, now there are probably thousands of papers addressing the issue of glutathione the concentration of glutathione in association with all sorts of different processes in cells. And what struck me as, as a very difficult one to, to cope with from a biochemical standpoint is that if you look at normal cells and ask the question, what is the glutathione concentration in normal cells? You find that in kidney cells and in liver cells, that can be 10 millimolar, sometimes even 15, closer to 20 millimolar. Whereas you look in other cell types, perfectly normal, healthy cells, it may be 0.1 millimolar. Now that's over a hundredfold range in glutathione concentration. And so from a biochemist point of view, in terms of metabolic regulation, it's very difficult to see how these two normal cells with a hundredfold different concentrations, how you, could, in a, how you could rationalize the glutathione concentration itself being important in control of anything. And so we began, yes? Uh, in, intestinal epithelial cells, uh, buccal epithelial cells, these have uh, a very low glutathione. Uh, red blood cells uh, can have. They, they usually are more at the range of 500 micromolar to 1 millimolar. But still, that's over an order of magnitude different from liver. Um, skeletal muscle, frequently 1 to 2 millimolar, as opposed to liver and kidney, uh, much higher. Uh, brain cells, some it, in cell culture, some brain cells will have a very low glutathione, 100 micromolar. Uh, uh, whereas others would be more in that range of closer to one millimolar, so tenfold range. But, but the point is that from an enzymologic standpoint, it's very difficult to see how normal concentrations that are so different could allow that species to be important in control. So we began to look at this question of, well, maybe it doesn't have to do with the GSH concentration per se, uh, one possibility is it could be relating to GSSG, but many cells, we had studied liver and kidney cells over a variety of different conditions, and the remarkable thing in those cells is that the GSSG concentration is almost constant. So again, you have the problem of GSSG doesn't appear to be a good sensor molecule. And so we started looking at the GSH and GSSG ratio, and then extrapolating from that, if you have a situation where you have enhanced generation of reactive oxygen species, then that, would, that should cause an oxidation and hence should give a change in this balance. Uh, if you have other free radical processes and use glutathione for maintaining the vitamin C and vitamin E pools, again there should be a demand on that system. And and that, of course, would be balanced by the biochemical reactions that converted it back. And so, in principle at least, this could give us a, a very sensitive and dynamic way to address the question of oxidative stress at the cellular level. Now, I had the great misfortune, I guess, of having chemical training. And, uh, uh, that training back at the University of Illinois taught me one thing about redox processes, and that is that you have to pay attention to the stoichiometry in a redox process. The reaction or the ratio, the comparison of GSH to GSSG is not a good comparison because the stoichiometry is wrong. 
there are two glutathione going to one GSSG, and that changes everything with regard to the reducing character of the system. Because the reducing character, the reducing power of the system is a function of the square of the GSH concentration. And that fundamental characteristic basically invalidates the use of GSH to GSSG as an expression of redox character in cells. So what we have done is we have gone back to the Ernst type calculation of a redox potential. Now this is used, this is, uh, this is standard nomenclature from chemistry. It's an electromotive force. It would be measured potentiometrically with an electrode. Uh, but in terms of individual redox couple, you can calculate it in terms of the concentration of the oxidized and the reduced species. This, uh, there's a, a series of constants in here that can be combined to give you this concentration dependent term. And then you have a, a term that is an expression of the inherent capability of that species to donate or accept electrons under standard conditions. So we have then an expression given in millivolts, which we call the redox potential or the electromotive force. And everything I'm going to talk about is using that. You don't need to remember this equation, but you ne do need to remember the principle that it is an expression, a mathematical expression. It's a way to quantify the reducing power of the glutathione system. Any questions over that? You've had that in at some point, you, and you slept through it. You didn't want to learn it. You did the problems and could never come up with the right answer, but I've been there too. So, But the point is, it's, it's a single quantifiable parameter that we can use to express the reducing power of a system, much in the same way as pH is used. And you can use that in terms of the tendency of a molecule to accept or donate uh, protons. OK, so redox potential. That's what we're talking about. Now let's look at the character of the redox potential in terms of that issue of a one electron versus a two electron transfer. And I apologize for those of you who haven't studied the chemistry of this, but this is very important as far as the, the, uh, the value of this system. If we look at a one electron transfer, there's a very shallow response as a function of the change in the redox potential. If we have a two electron transfer, it becomes much sharper. And if we have combined two of these centers together, it, become, it can be almost straight up and down. And this effectively allows redox to control enzymes, transcription factors, all aspects of metabolism. So the big question then is, what is the redox state in cells? And then secondly, are the changes large enough to allow this to function in any useful way in control of the cell functions? So I'm going to give you bottom line here, no data. But it, this was work that Ward Curlin did as a, as a graduate student with me. What he found was that he was looking in HT29 cells. And so this is sort of the paradigm. This is the cell line that we, we started with. And I'll show you in a minute that this is, is a fairly general phenomenon. That even though you can have GSH concentrations vary by a hundredfold, if we look at the redox potential, most systems have, if they're dividing cells, the redox potential is right about here at minus 260 to minus 230 millivolts. If cells are growth arrested, if you take cells in culture and allow them to come to contact inhibition, or if you remove growth factors and they stop dividing, or if you look at differentiated cells in vivo, they tend to have a redox potential right about here, minus 220 to minus 190 millivolts. Again, independent of the actual concentration of GSH and GSSG, but combined into that term. This, they all fall into a very narrow range of redox. And if you induce cells to undergo apoptosis, 
whether they're proliferating cells or whether they're differentiated cells, whether it is a, a receptor-mediated apoptosis, a toxicologic-mediated apoptosis, mitochondrial, they come to a redox potential right about minus 180 to minus 150 millivolts. And what's the pH for one-to-one glutathione It's concentration-dependent. The midpoint potential is minus uh, minus 240 millivolts, but it's but it is it's changes according to what your concentration, your pool size is. If you go more oxidized than minus 150, cells die by necrosis. Fairly simple uh, character, and I have some of that data here on uh, looking at different cell types. Uh, the list is much longer than this now. That even in vivo and in, in in starved and refed. Uh, rats, uh, there's this same type of shift. Now, of course, in, the, in vivo, you have a mixture of cell types, and some are dividing and some are not dividing, and so it, it's not quite as clean. But clearly, the shift is there nonetheless. So the, the concept, then, is, uh, is that at the cellular level, this glutathione redox potential could provide us with a mechanism for what we call context-dependent regulation. In other words, if you have one component of the proliferative machinery that requires the redox to be in this range, if the cells are more oxidized than that, they won't proliferate. Similarly, if you have gene expression systems that will only work when the redox potential is minus 200 millivolts, if the, if the cell is more reduced than that, i.e. proliferating, they won't express that differentiated phenotype. So in essence, it provides a very simple mechanism for basically controlling cell functions. Put some, if you put that into a given redox range, the cells can only do what's permissible within that redox range. Now, present this as dogma, as though this is fact. This is working hypothesis, folks. Okay, We have no cause-effect relationship established. This is all association data that we have. Try as we will, we have not been able to actually intervene. The only way that we've been able to intervene is, for instance, putting in very high concentrations of NAC. And you get low concentrations of NAC doesn't affect the intracellular redox. And therefore, there's a whole lot we don't understand. But the general picture is this association. Has this been, this has been shown for a number of different cell types? I mean, that. that Reduction, oxidation, moves from proliferation to... Yeah. Let's go through some of these, because they're, they're rather interesting. Uh, we've done most of the work on HT29 cells. This is a uh, uh, moderately differentiated colon carcinoma cell. They can be differentiated by adding sodium butyrate or other differentiating agents. And this is a, just as a general characteristic that if they're rapidly dividing and you differentiate them, they move over here. If you just allow these cells to grow to contact inhibition, they will similarly shift. And eventually, just with contact inhibition, they ultimately go on to terminal differentiation and die by apoptosis, and they shift over here. So over a period of about three to four weeks in culture, you get this entire progression from rapid proliferation to growth arrest in differentiated phenotype on to terminal differentiation and apoptosis. Is the, the more towards proliferation? The more reducing. And it's more reduced. That's more reduced, right. What's the uh, pH of a fully mature red cell? Uh, minus 193 millivolts. So it's right in that. It's, um, it's probably one of the most oxidized of what we'd consider differentiated cells. Um, fairly recently, there was a paper pushed by uh, Mark Noble, mm -hmm. who said for, ma for uh, neur neural cells, I guess glial cells, that there's the same 
picture is, is true. Right. that these cells get into confluency and then you try to change that redox state. You give it Niagara or um, something else. Well, basically they don't, it, they don't respond, uh, most of these cells, I mean, first of all, the cells in culture, uh, most of them are abnormal cells. Um, if you take uh, retinal pigment epithelial cells, which we, what we work with are normal, uh, these are normal human cells that we get from, uh, uh, from cadaver eyes, and we establish the cells. If we allow them to, to uh, grow and become confluent, they shift from a reduced state to, a, to an oxidized state. If we resuspend those cells and replate them out at lower cell number, they revert back to a more reduced state while they are proliferating. Uh, with, uh, with regard to your question, as far as, pro, you know, con if you have a confluent cells and you add the NAC, for instance, it does not change the intracellular, under those conditions, it doesn't change the intracellular redox. We haven't actually done the studies where we put it up to a high amount and see if it killed the cells. But basically what, what one would predict is that some of the cells would lift off from the plate because of the thiols, too, too much thiols, really, re too reducing of an environment. But we haven't really done that, uh, that experiment. Uh, we have done experiments where we've taken cells and growth arrested them by removing serum, for instance. These were studies with KCO2 cells. In KCO2 cells, if you remove the serum, they will stop growing. And you can then get them to regrow by shifting the redox potential. Okay. So that's the closest. So that's the closest to cause effect that we have. But I'm not willing to say that it is causal at this point. It is clearly associated with changes in proliferation. Okay? First point, I only have one more point in the talk, so if you have questions on this, so we can deal with them. Well, you know, there's, there's recently been um, a lot of uh, uh, studies of um, DNA microarrays, gene chips, mm -hmm. looking at expression of um, many different genes under different circumstances. Uh, have you have you had any opportunity to look at uh, at those expression differences? We we have done that. Uh, it's quite dramatic that you can you get predictable types of changes. But it comes back to this issue again of cause and effect. We don't know what the what the initial signal is uh, that would be causing the change. I mean, for instance, PCNA goes up dramatically uh, when we stim when we change the redox state to stimulate the the growth. Uh, the other, the other part, it's, some, some people don't, it's a, uh, yeah, PCNA stands for proliferating cell nuclear antigen that's, uh, uh, goes way up, and I, they, the mechanism of that's known, but I don't remember what it is, uh, as far as how it works or what it's involved in, but that's one of the ones that goes up dramatically, but the, the problem, maybe if, I don't guess I have the data here, but, um, one of the, it was one of the, um, the uh, NIH 3T3 cells that are very interesting because these are cells that are used for uh, transformation assays. Uh, one of my colleagues has been studying the NADPH oxidase, which causes reactive oxygen species generation and is associated with enhanced proliferation and, in, and transformation. But these, that, that enzyme produces reactive oxygen species. So the prediction would be you transfect in an enzyme that causes stimulation of cell growth by reactive oxygen species, your prediction would be that cells would become, the thiol disulfide pool would become more oxidized. We measured it. It does not. It becomes more reduced. And so clearly the, the cells are smarter than we are as far as interpreting what's happening. Uh, Presumably, that reactive oxygen species is a site-specific generation causing a signal generation at one site, which is then presumably upregulating the, the glutathione systems. Um, we haven't been able to figure out what that target is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't include that. Uh, that was really where we started, and that was why we had looked at HT29 cells. Uh, we were using um, some of these detoxification enzyme inducers, uh, 
uh, sulforaphane, a compound that's present in broccoli that uh, is why we all should be uh, eating our broccoli. Um, anyway, that upregulates the expression of glutathione S-transferase, quinone reductase, and the rate-limiting enzyme in glutathione synthesis, the gamma glutamyl cysteine synthetase. And when you add those inducers, you see a concentration-dependent oxidation of the glutathione state, the glutathione pool in the cell, a, a, a tightly associated increase in induction, transcriptional activation. Um, it's not, I, it, we're working now on the mechanism. It appears to be mediated through an oxidant activation of, uh, of a, a transcription factor called NERF2, which is in the cytoplasm. Upon, an, upon that oxidation signal, that is translocated to the nucleus and is what activates the transcription. Um, we don't know there what the oxidizing, uh, you know, how the, exactly the oxidation occurs, but clearly in this signaling pathway, it is redox dependent. Okay. Yep. So, what, what can they enable the glutathione GSH, GSH, G ratio? I think so, glutathione reductase can convert GSG into GSH. Right. So, if the enzymatic activity of glutathione reductase is constant, the NADPH and NADP ratio should be associated. Okay. This is an important issue, which I didn't really talk about. Uh, the glutathione pool is maintained by NADPH. The redox potential of the NADPH pool, if you go on this scale, it's right about over here. It's minus 400 millivolts. So really, under essentially all conditions, normal physiology, the, the NADPH pool is fully sufficient to reduce the GSSG. So there, there must be a balance between the oxidative reactions and the reductive reactions. And the, the answer to that isn't clear, but it's probable that it really has to do with the kinetics of reduction of GSSG by the reductase, that you simply don't have, uh, that the KM is too high. And so you, have, you maintain this pool of GSSG so that reduction reaction is really determined by the concentration of the GSSG in the cell. That's, uh, that's tough enzymology, though, when it starts working at the cellular level. So we don't know how that's controlled under the most conditions. We have shown, we have a series of papers over the last couple of years where we've shown how this oxidation occurs during apoptosis. And that is a consequence of a, a shift in the mitochondrial electron transfer chain so that the mitochondria begin to just simply spew out superoxide and hydrogen peroxide during that apoptotic process. Uh, that's due to the cytochrome C release mechanism and is coupled to that. So if you release cytochrome C, mitochondria become generators of oxidants, and that's why the cells come over here. Okay? Mm -hmm. Positive effect data is yet, but theoretically, could someone altering their uh, redox state by something like that set themselves up to be uh, 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 predisposed to some un unwanted uh, uh, aspect of cell proliferation, neoplasm uh, induction, that sort of thing? Uh, in principle, yes. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the real danger is that as we get older, we accumulate precancerous cells. As we accumulate mitochondrial DNA damage, uh, we, we do develop cells that, are, that do have an enhanced proliferative capacity. The shift in the redox state from our data, in vitro data, will result in an enhanced proliferation of those cells. So in principle, um, there is a risk of enhanced proliferation of precancerous cells um, that could, in, in fact, enhance uh, tumor genicity. Um, uh, it's, it's probably going to end up to be a, a, uh, a benefit to risk. Uh, analysis that we'll have to do on that as far as aging. I think, these, the, I think that there are a whole host 
of degenerative diseases which would probably benefit from NAC and that there probably is the counter side to that that there may be in some individuals an enhanced tumor development um, and that's just something we're going to have to cope with. Mm -hmm. You said when you pick these cell cultures that you allow them to go to confluence that the potential approach is zero and when, you, more oxidized, when right. you resuspend them it becomes more reduced. You didn't say if you dump NAC on them, they'd start proliferating again after they were confluent, did you? No. No. In fact, that was the question. My, we haven't done exactly that experiment. We have done the experiment where we've taken them to um, uh, where we have, by growth manipulations, chain, brought them into a condition where we have, where they're still dividing, but they're not dividing as rapidly, and then put in NAC and can show that we can stimulate their division at that state by presumably by shifting the redox but uh, uh, th those types of experiments are, are really very artifactual I'll show you one one piece of data which uh, hopefully will clarify that okay yeah, so what, what you're summarizing for us is that you can't really just talk about reduced or oxidized giving the a single final result Right. Although you got a you got a general association between proliferation versus differentiation, right? But in many specific situations, it could actually be the reverse, right? Yeah, and, and exactly, and 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 that's the issue that why I think that that I, I, this doesn't mean that value, measurements of glutathione per se are not of value, but this is another aspect of the glutathione that that I think is it needs to be incorporated into the way we're thinking about it. response and then the, the redox uh, potential could be uh, not allow that to occur simply uh, because of the, the environment created by the redox potential. Right, and the reason that's so important is that if you have a cell that's that should be differentiated and should not be proliferating and then have something that upregulates something like thioredoxin system or glutathione synthesis condition you could in fact be turning on a proliferation inappropriately uh, okay so we call this context dependent regulation it's just uh, verbiage that we're talking about that's the concept uh, again, cause and effect is something that we really need to establish. Um, just a summary of that. Um, it's, we do have good data that this is a reversible process with regard to proliferation and growth arrest. Uh, the apoptosis, this is a downstream event. Uh, when you get to this level of oxidation, it's, it's a no recovery type of a situation where the, the cells are committed to death. <clears throat> okay, so now I want to come back to the question of clinical measurement. Uh, we actually started this before we started the cellular work, but it's, been ta it's taken a long time in the development. But it's the same concept. Can we apply this concept of redox to, to give us a useful measure of oxidative stress or health, really a, an indicator of health in vivo, redox health. Um, quick summary relative to the discussion yesterday, the liver is the main organ for supplying blood plasma glutathione. Uh, it's not the sole source of glutathione, but it is the major one. Uh, the liver also supplies glutathione in bile, uh, thus providing control of the luminal redox and then the glutathione is broken down to cysteine and that's released black, back into circulation in the uh, kidney is the main source of breakdown of the glutathione back to cysteine into circulation so there is this dynamic uh, turnover of glutathione from the liver the liver releases essentially all of its glutathione every hour and what that does in this turnover is it maintains the cysteine pool throughout the body now there are a variety of technical problems for measurement of the redox state and, and the biggest problem that we encountered was the sensitivity to be able to measure GSSG 
the, the enzymatic method that most people use is not specific for GSSG, and so it really is an invalid measurement. So for our purposes to measure redox, we had to actually be able to measure GSSG and know that it was GSSG. Second problem is that red cells contain uh, about 500 times uh, higher concentration of glutathione than present in the plasma, and thus even a, a very minimal, even 0.1% hemolysis can be sufficient to give you an, an unsatisfactory uh, value for the circulating redox state. So you have to really avoid hemolysis. And then there's the problem of the redox changes during the processing. So we worked on this for several years. And um, uh, the strategy that we used, if you go down through the logic of this, enzymatic me methods simply are not specific enough. Uh, mainly because this, in the plasma, there's a cysteine glutathione mixed disulfide, which is relatively large, and it gives uh, a large error in the enzymatic-based reactions. Colorimetric and fluorometric methods based upon glutathione aren't specific enough because you have about 8 to 10 micromolar cysteine in the blood. You only have 2 to 3 micromolar glutathione in the blood, so you can't get good measurements this way. Uh, the standard methods, then, are relying upon HPLC, um, most of these depend upon the negative charge on the molecule. You note that there's one positive charge, two negative charges. And so you can use this uh, net negative charge as a basis for separation. You can detect by a variety of different means. Um, many of the standard methods depend upon uh, a fluorometric derivatives of the thiol. Of course, if you use that as your approach, you can't measure the disulfides, except by difference. And then by difference, again, it doesn't work because you have contamination with other molecules. So what we have resorted to is derivatization based upon the amine. We use Danzel chloride, and that allows us to measure both GSH and GSSG simultaneously, and as well get cysteine and cysteine. Um, quickly, uh, this was some of the work that uh, Diane uh, uh, I'm sorry, Paula Samiak did in the lab. Uh, we were looking, we're interested mainly in macular degeneration patients, and uh, we uh, had age-matched controls. We had, this was done in the eye center in collaboration with Paul Sternberg, and we, we had included a lot of other uh, patients in the, from the eye center, and these happened to be individuals with diabetic retinopathy. Um, and what we found was that there was a substantial oxidation in otherwise healthy individuals in association with age. And this was indeed the, the largest effect that we saw. There was, however, this uh, significant oxidation in the diabetics uh, that was uh, when we did age-matched controls. These individuals would be considered about 20, their, their redox age would be about 20 years older than their chronologic age. So they are truly oxidized. Uh, we're now, uh, we now have this method that uh, we're standardizing it and making it available for routine uh, measurement. This is a study that we've recently completed. Uh, haven't actually done all the analyses on it yet, but it was a work that Vino Modi did as a, uh, he's a medical student, did as a, a uh, project with us, uh, where we looked at individuals as a function of age. And what you see here, beginning at about 45 years old, is a progressive oxidation at the rate of approximately one millivolt per year. Now, if we go back to those equations, I showed you that picture of, of how a redo what that redox dependence looks like. A 30 millivolt change, that's the change between an average 45-year-old and an average 75-year-old. A 30 millivolt change would be the equivalent of about a tenfold change in the functional activity of a thiol component that where the, of a component that had a redox dependent thiol. So again, we have not identified any specific component that has that, that dynamic response over that range. So we haven't been able to say, yes, there is this protein that at, in 75 year olds is this oxidized and therefore it has this activity relative to the 45-year-old. But in principle, that's what this means. If there is such a system, um, that oxidation can be quite important.
These are plasma, yeah. So how, how far do you, I mean, can you extrapolate from the plasma pool to the actual intracellular? Well, I, I'll show you what we've done with this. Um, just a couple slides. Um, important point is that the circulating cysteine pool is considerably more oxidized. This is what the cysteine pool looks like. This is what the glutathione pool looks like. Um, an important difference here is that the, the glutathione pool does not appear to change before that 45-year-old break point. The cysteine pool appears to be continuous. And we don't know whether that's real or artifactual, uh, whether it's meaningful or not, because the, the numbers are temp simply too small to be able to make any, in, any inferences on that. Mm -hmm. So did you tell us, are you directly measuring QSSG? Yes, we are directly measuring GSSG. It's a fluorometric uh, derivatization with Dansel chloride and separation by HPLC. Cysteine and cysteine, yes. And so you can see there's an age-dependent change in both. And obviously, this is why the questions came up with NAC and why this is so important, because um, it very well could be that NAC will reduce this pool and not touch this pool. So as we think about the uh, responses, um, we have to consider that there are multiple thiol disulfide pools. Uh, if one were talking about uh, kinetics, it would appear more likely that we would affect the cysteine-cysteine pool. And indeed, in circulation, this is the major pool. All right. Uh, let, let, me, let me summarize in, in just two. Uh, I can. I'm sorry. Okay. All right. Well, then. Sorry, guys. I'll be done. All right. Uh, <clears throat> we've done this with other things, but I uh, want to show you just two, two pictures here. Uh, this was we took cells in culture, and we've done this now with multiple cell types and varied the extracellular redox according to what we measured known to be now present in humans. Uh, cysteine, cysteine pool is right here. Glutathione, glutathione disulfide pool is right about here. Uh, this pretty much encompasses the full range of redox that we would see. Um, this is looking at cell proliferation using BRDU incorporation. We've done this now with other methods of prolif setting proliferation as well. The general response, although not absolutely uniform response, is shown here. That is that as you go from the physiologic redox to a more reducing state, the proliferation is enhanced. As you go from the normal young individual value to a more oxidized value, proliferation slows down. Gener it appears to be a fairly general response, although not completely uniform. The other response that we've studied has to do with the fast, fast ligand system for apoptosis. And uh, this system, what we found was that in response to oxidative stress, this has been shown by others, that there is an enhanced expression of both fast and fast ligand that is dependent, that is induced by oxidants. And the uh, remarkable feature of this uh, is that if we look at cell death here, tunnel positive staining, uh, as well as change in forward light scatter, these are control cells. These are apoptotic cells here in the uh, following oxidative stress. If we treat with either NAC or with glutathione, we can completely eliminate that process that oxidative stress. This is nothing new. This was shown by uh, many others before us. But the important issue here is that if we look at those responses to oxidative stress, that the inclusion of the thiols really blocks that rapid change in fast ligand and fast. Now, what's the importance of that relative to this question in vivo? Well, the in vivo issue is that if we become oxidized by 30 millivolts as we age, and if that controls the expression of the death receptor systems, 
then basically we are enhancing the susceptibility of all of those cells that are, that are responding to any stimulus that's going to cause death through this mechanism. And so it could be a very general importance. Again, we don't know, but these are, this is where the, the data is leading us is into that question that this central parameter of oxidative stress, thiol disulfide redox, could be a good indicator of the responses of cells both for regeneration and for sensitivity to apoptosis. So I'll stop there, and I apologize to you guys for running over. I wasn't paying attention to the time. <clears throat> okay. Dinner until seven either. So, uh, okay, well, I'm. I, th I think there certainly is time for some questions, uh, general or specific. Questions. And, and John, you have to wait <laughs> Dr. Jones isn't finished yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so, I mean, I, 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 I certainly admire and, uh, and approve uh, your very conservative way of looking at, at, uh, at cells and in terms of redox and terms of many other things, where it's not really proven unless you, as a biochemist, you know, can really isolate a specific system. I mean, so Arthur Kornberg, you know, this building, you know, was very, uh, uh, you know, he, he could make things absolutely definite by working with a single enzyme, well pure and come to a real conclusion on that. But then he could make no, he would not, for many years, make any conclusions about the cell. Because you don't have a pure enzyme, you don't have a pure system. And what you're saying is, seems to fairly similar in that tradition. Right. And yet there are uh, things that, that we want, conclusions that we want to at least tentatively reach uh, in, in physiology and medicine and uh, in cell biology here. And the lessons I, I get from your, uh, your correlations are that, in fact, there is a reasonable guess that some, some systems, more than a reasonable guess, I guess, so that some systems are, it's going to be cause and effect. But there are other systems that you don't know which ones they are in all cases. You know, the cause and effect is, is more distant. Particularly when you got many different parameters, and I'd like to know for my own sake and for the sake of the patients of many of the doctors that I end up training, you know, is it a good idea to give people more oxidants for all sorts of purposes? Do you get more proliferation, or is it better to more give? <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> you know, or, the, or the other direction, and it, it isn't. The lesson that I think I've gotten is that you don't do much harm. In fact, you do good to keep systems in a reduced state uh, right. in, in in general. Yeah. If you agree with that, well, that would yeah. be interesting. Well, I, I, I think I. I mean, I, in general, I do agree with that. I think that. Um, uh, I think in terms of uh, you know where where I am cautious is in the. Uh, in the fact that glutathione is, doesn't really react very much with, even though it's a huge pool, it doesn't really react with, with, with proteins except via enzymes. It's too sluggish. The reactions are too slow. And so uh, even though it's this parameter, and we call it a dynamic parameter because indeed we add oxidants, it becomes oxidized, we stimulate the reducing systems, it goes back. We still don't know what systems, if any, that it's actually directly controlling. And that would be, uh, until we know that, until we have sorted out those, then we have, we have to leave open the questions of uh, benefit in vivo. Uh, I, don't, you know, I don't know any other way to, as a scientist to, to make a statement on that because it's not, the answer's not there. Yeah, Dave? 
could also turn on what the biological context of the cell and, and the organ system was, in that if you if are going to ask, when, is it appropriate or helpful to give an antioxidant, then would you want to not place that in the context of, is this, is this system diseased, or is this system under chronic stress? Absolutely, and I mean, that has been our great failing in the studies that we have done up until the last, you know, really few years. We looked, as in the traditional approach, you look at young, healthy people. And from all we can tell, young, healthy people, just like the healthy proliferating cells, they don't respond. But that's not to say that a person under a diseased state or a condition where the cells are struggling with being able to maintain that redox, that in fact the boost would be of great benefit. And so I think that it's not really a cause to not do experiments and to not study it. It's really a, a reason to study it and specifically study it in the populations uh, at risk. I don't see at present that there's much that you're really, I mean, there is this question about proliferation of precancerous cells that, uh, you know, we are, well, I actually have a grant application on it, no funding yet, but, uh, but that is a, a, a potentially important issue, but if that's only a small fraction of the people or a small risk, the potential benefit is a lot greater. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it relies a lot on what you're saying, it relies a lot obviously on, on having a, a method to detect uh, the redox state in, right. in the disease state, and do we rely just on GSH levels in plasma or the uh, ratio or redox potential? Right. Um, I think it's absolutely right that if it's if it's a disease state, if there's a deficiency, that should be corrected. I mean, if it's, I was saying it, if it's if it's not broken, don't fix it. Yeah. Um, healthy people, probably over supplementation with antioxidants is not necessarily a good thing. Right. And the, the and question had to do with with assay, and that's what we're trying to do. And developing a clinical assay is terribly difficult. I mean, the, all of the standardization, calibration, and so forth, we are really pretty much at that point right now that uh, we, we do have a facility set up where we can do these measurements. Um, do we have a gold standard? Are we standardized relative to any other laboratory? No. So uh, I've been working with people at CDC to try to get that set up. If we can get that into the NHANES study, for instance, where they do 20,000 people a year, we'll be able to have that calibration. But right now, we don't, uh, we, we have to work toward that. Mm -hmm. Rick? Uh, I think the uh, question of whether too much uh, redox potential could be harmful is, is a very germane question right now and practical in that a lot of the beneficials and beneficial effects of antioxidants are touted and people are taking, you know, large amounts of different antioxidants over the counter. And these, uh, Recent study of course beta carotene is a right. chemo prophylaxis or a, a cancer prophylaxis agent that actually was associated with increased uh, uh, incidence of lung cancer in patients that, that took it. So uh, it seems like a, a real, real important question to try to handle. On. I, I, my perception is that people that are healthy. <coughs> and young, I feel like, gosh, I should still take a lot of uh, antioxidants. It couldn't hurt, but there may be some dangers out there that, uh, that we wouldn't know for years down the road. Yeah. So I, think, I think the real yeah. issue is something. If you look at most of those antioxidants, like vitamin C and E, their redox potential is plus 0.1 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you're on the other side of right. the chain. Well, I know mm -hmm. that. Uh, Carotene is in the same category as a glutathione prodrug, but comes in that general antioxidant category. Yeah. Rick, I think what Kilo's point is that a lot of the things that are called antioxidants are actually pro-oxidants when they take them, and that's one of the problems, and that may be the reason for the beta carotene results coming out opposite. But, uh, Dean, I just wanted to point out that uh, much as we love in vitro experiments, I was very chastened by the fact that um, there's a particular B cell marker that's sensitive to HIF-1 alpha presence. And HIF-1 alpha, as you know, is destroyed when the cell goes into hyperoxic condition.
conditions, and a hypoxic condition sits there, and it's a negative regulator of this marker. So when we put the cells into culture, and we looked at that particular marker, that marker goes sky high. In other words, HIF1-alpha is, is markedly changed in the hyperoxic conditions that we have in culture. Mm -hmm. Hence, I don't know what to make anymore out of culture wow. experiments. I never liked them in the first place because there always seemed to be a disruption of the animal. Now I'm getting pretty sure that, in fact, everything we do has to have an in vivo veritas um, uh, statement. So that's one thought. The second thought is that there's a very, very interesting paper in Nature a little while, in uh, The Lancet a little while back on a disease called ichthyosis, which doesn't bother very many people, but is a, a failure of skin apoptosis. So you get all this scaling. And these people showed that if you rub NAC into the arm, uh, you can prevent the ichthyosis. And then they went to, to studies of skin cells, and they showed that skin cells, unlike internal cells don't like, re the, the reducing condition helps to induce the apoptosis and the oxidative condition prevents the apoptosis. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be very, very cell dependent aside from anything else in terms of the tumors. And then the third thing to say is that talking to Charles Myers about prostate cancer cells and what kills them, I f he told me that there were some things that were involved, and I said, well, maybe you better not give NAC to a prostate cancer patient. He said, oh, no, the way the mechanism works, that doesn't matter. And I can't really get this back to it, but in fact, there, there are compensatory mechanisms. So what I come down to is that the body has its normal ways of dealing with these things, that as people get older, we know the aging process results in tumors, so it's probably not that they're, it's probably the oxidative condition is worse towards getting a tumor. You're more likely to get one when you're older. And conversely, the younger people with maintaining their redox level are doing the best of all. So maybe the fountain of youth is a little bit of redox stuff. Okay. I don't know. Well, I, just I'll make a couple quick comments on that. One is that we've looked in uh, about a half a dozen different cell types at what the redox is, the cysteine cysteine redox is in the culture medium. Very common uh, characteristic of cells, you change the culture medium, typically containing cysteine, takes a while for them to recover and start growing again. Um, the cells universally that we've looked at so far, and again, it's only about a half a dozen cell lines, they universally bring the, the, the cysteine cysteine redox to minus 80 millivolts. And this occurs in some cells over one to two hours. And it doesn't matter whether you're starting with cysteine or cysteine. Over a very short time, they bring it right to the same value. And so my feeling is there has to be something <laughs> related to that. Uh, it, it also says that if it, if it is changing that much with aging, then there is some fundamental change that's going on. And our guess is it has to do with mitochondrial function, and that's what we're, we're looking at. Yeah. shut down the energy supply with GAPD, G6PD into the mitochondria, what would your view of the consequences be? Of uh, shutting down the pento, essentially the, the NADPH supply. Um, there are multiple sources of NADPH, and uh, uh, the experiments that we have done on that have been all related to detoxification reactions, and we haven't gone back and asked that question here. Uh, I really don't know, but my guess is that, that it would, you'd probably have a, a range at which there would be no effect, and then once you got to the point where you had an effect, it would be a very dramatic effect. Does that mean that when you put the cell under oxidative stress, according to Pietro Getzi's results, who should have been here but couldn't, uh, but he, you, you inactivate GAPD, it's not just his results, um, who told me? Yeah, GAPD, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a very sensitive reaction yeah, to I oxidants. Mean, Ian worked on that as well, yeah. But that's a very sensitive enzyme. 
and it probably G6PD is equally sensitive, and maybe the thyroidoxin pathway is equally sensitive. Right. So when the cell just begins to lose glutathione and goes under, uh, goes into oxidative stress, these enzymes are going to shut down. Right. And that may be a key part of the whole apoptosis cycle, but everybody starts with the mitochondria rather than with the energy supply into the mitochondria. There's where to put that out. Yeah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> to the uh, camera there. <coughs> okay. Well, I'd like I'd like to thank uh, both Lee and Len for um, and BioAdvantex for inviting me here today. Um, and, and, and these last few days, these discussions that we've been having on uh, NAC and uh, GSH, I'm kind of coming here with a rogue compound, I guess. It's uh, acetonazolmethionine. It's, um, uh, for me, it's a compound that I've been studying uh, for a number of years, and so it's not a rogue compound, and I hope to perhaps convince you to uh, take it a little bit more seriously and as a real contender, if you like, um, but also as a... Uh, as an adjuvant to uh, other treatments as well. Uh, the title, as you see, is acetonazolmethionine as a glutathione prodrug. And um, I'd like to take you through, first of all, uh, some of the therapeutic uses of, uh, of uh, SAMe. Um, it's tend it tends to be called either SAM or SAMe. Um, SAMe is a catchy name, which is more of a marketing ploy, I guess. Um, I've always called it SAM, but um, I'll, I'll stick to SAMe now. Um, it is a compound that, that is available. It's, a, it's a, a product that you can go out and buy. Over here in the United States, it's uh, a dietary supplement. It, in Europe and many European countries, it's a, a prescription medication. It's used uh, for the treatment of several disorders, um, primarily depression, osteoarthritis, and liver disease are the three main uh, uh, therapeutic uses. It has potential in other disorders uh, such as Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's disease, and possibly HIV infection, but there really have been no clinical trials of any significance in these uh, other disorders. Um, however, in depression and osteoarthritis and liver disease, there are numerous trials, um, probably over 40 uh, double-blind uh, and uh, controlled trials in depression uh, a number in osteoarthritis and, and in liver disease. Um, I've highlighted both HIV infection and liver disease because I will focus uh, this talk a, a bit more on these two disorders, uh, mainly on the biochemistry and on the role of uh, SAMI and GSH in those uh, two particular disorders. Um, this is to really run you through uh, the biochemistry and the connection between uh, SAMI and glutathione itself. Uh, SAMI uh, has a precursor which is the essential amino acid methionine. It condenses with ATP in a reaction as catalyzed by methionine adenosyl transferase. One of the most important functions of SAMI is to donate a methyl group to various methyl uh, group acceptors, and there are over 100 of them at least. There are at least over 100 methyl transferase reactions in the body. Uh, that includes DNA, proteins, phospholipids, <coughs> neurotransmitters. Uh, macromolecules and other small molecular weight molecules. They all accept m uh, methyl groups and in doing so either changes the conformational structure of proteins or uh, the phospholipids or even uh, proteins on DNA which can uh, 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 change its function there. One of the um, byproducts of these methylation reactions is uh, SAH, s adenosyl homocysteine, and this is rapidly removed to homocysteine and uh, that process is in this f direction here uh, towards homocysteine. However, if homocysteine uh, is allowed to accumulate, which it can do under certain conditions, particularly in B12 and folate deficiency, this reaction can go back and SAH can actually inhibit many of these methyltransferase reactions. Homocysteine is actually a gatekeeper here in, this, uh, in, in, in the methylation cycle. It can either be condensed with serine to form cystothionine, and then that ultimately ends up in glutathione. Or homocysteine can be remethylated, a methyl group coming from methylfolate, 
to methionine, and then that enters back into the methylation cycle. SAM plays, or SAMe plays a important regulatory role in this respect because it is a positive allosteric activator of the cystifinin beta synthetase enzyme. And when SAMe levels are low, this enzyme is inhibited and you get homocysteine shifting towards the methylation cycle uh, rather than the transsulfuration cycle and glutathione synthesis. Um, when SAM levels are high, we don't need to uh, remethylate the homocysteine so much, so we're actually activating this enzyme a little more, and it's more as channeling down through to glutathione and transsulfuration pathways. That's just a real quick um, introduction on the biochemical connection between acetinosomethionine and, and glutathione. And, and as we'll go along, we'll see that the, the two are actually very um, uh, intimately connected in many ways. But as a uh, pharmaceutical product, and even now as a dietary supplement, we need to know a little bit more about its pharmacokinetics. If we want to administer uh, SAMe exogenously and see what happens to its metabolism, we need to know uh, the pharmacokinetics of this, of this compound. And uh, a long time ago, they've uh, studied this uh, in six healthy uh, volunteers and looked at the uh, pharmacokinetics uh, at two different doses, low and high doses, and, we, and it has a, a bi-exponential decay. Um, there's a very rapid phase, which is uh, where it's metabolized by first-pass process, and that's where the bulk of the acid denosomethionine is actually metabolized by the liver, first-pass process. has a very rapid half-life, uh, approximately 100 minutes. Um, this rapid half-life, many regard as being too short for it to be of any potential value, However, as Ian mentioned yesterday, same situation with N-acetylcysteine. This is a natural compound. It's going in, to quote his words, along tracks that are laid down. It's a bit redundant just to think of uh, this rapid half-life as being in insignificant for it to be, uh, or, or is not, not significant enough for it to have any therapeutic use because it's being metabolized in the body to other compounds which are then being utilized. Uh, and, and are actually making uh, a, a difference. IV preparations are, are very good to start with. You need an oral preparation, which you can use for long-term treatments. And one was developed uh, towards the end of uh, the 1980s. We were the first uh, group to actually look at the bioavailability of oral SAMI. And this was actually um, dose response curves done in, in several um, healthy volunteers, of which I was the one who got the 1,000 milligram dose, first of all. Um, nobody else would try it, and I had to put myself forward. Um, but as you see here, there is a, we, we actually collected every hour for the first hour, and then at 12 hours, and then at 24 hours, and we constructed these um, uh, decay curves here. Uh, the bioavailability actually ends up being about 3 to 5 percent. Again, very low, but um, I, I'm not going to focus too much on that, and it's, it's something that some people will pick up on and say, well, you know, it's just too low to be uh, useful, but in fact, um, it's metabolized naturally, and that's what is important. Other studies have looked at the utilization of SAMI in the body by, uh, other investigators have, have looked at the utilization of SAMI in the body by giving uh, the molecule labeled either in the sulfur position, S35, or at the tritiated, uh, here using tritiated uh, methyl group, SAMI. And when you, uh, it has been given to six human subjects, healthy volunteers again, 100 milligrams labeled either in the uh, methyl position, the tritium, or the S35 in the sulfur position. And if we look at the radioactivity in plasma over time, we see that the methyl, the radioactivity in the methyl group is still, it continues to rise over uh, 60 hours and stays elevated for quite a period of time, 120 hours. The um, molecule that passes through to the transsulfuration pathway actually um, rises steeply in the first 20 hours or so and then <clears throat> gradually decays down. From these radioactivity studies, we can actually extrapolate and uh, look at other data. If you, collected, if you collect urine and feces from these subjects, which they did, um, this was actually done by the laboratories 
uh, who, who uh, manufactured the S-adenosyl methionine compound. Um, if we look at the total amount of uh, S35 and tritiated uh, radioactivity excreted, we come up with the, these figures here, which show that for the methyl group, 38%, approximately 38% is excreted, and therefore 62%, approximately 62% of it is utilized. And for the sulfur portion, the amount that's going through down a transsulfuration pathway, ultimately glutathione synthesis, 60% is excreted and 40% is utilized. So, the, so it's actually taken in, ab, goes into endogenous pools in the body and is actually used um, like the natural molecule that's present in the body. I'd like to just to touch on a little bit about uh, some of the two diseases, HIV infection and liver disease, but HIV first. And the studies that have been done with SAMI in, in these two disorders. Um, there are at least three different groups, independent studies, that have reported SAMI, to be, SAMI levels to be low in, in HIV infection. And these have all looked at spinal fluid levels. And one of the reasons is that it was easier to uh, measure SAMI in spinal fluid than it, w it was actually to do in blood. In blood, you actually have to have more handling, and, and really people have only looked in spinal fluid. Three independent studies have shown that it has, was, was low in, in HIV-infected patients, decreased. We have recently tried to reproduce some of these data and, and come up with the same conclusions, except that we've uh, divided our patients, our HIV-positive patients. These are actually all stage three and stage four uh, HIV infection um, into patients with myelopathy and those without. The reason for this is that we believe a deficiency of SAMI causes HIV myelopathy. And myelopathy is a demyelinating condition where the myelin sheath comes away from the nerve, it creates vacuoles, and the SAMI is actually, or methylation, the process of meth methylating myelin basic protein causes it to be more compact. If you have <coughs> hypomethylation, undermethylation of that myelin basic protein, it comes away and causes vacuoles to appear. Um, so there was, a fair, there was actually a, a rationale for treating at least HIV-positive patients with myelopathy to see if you could prevent, prevent that, that uh, vacuolar myelopathy. And in fact, there is a trial that we're involved with at the moment looking at the efficacy not of SAMe in treating myelopathy, but in looking at the efficacy of methionine in, in treating HIV myelopathy. Most of these patients here also have methionine deficiency, which could be one of the causes for their SAMI deficiency. Uh, the outcome of that trial is not known yet. We, we, we really haven't got to a point that we can break the uh, codes on the trial. However, a pilot study that I was involved with to look at the um, ability of SAMI to pass across the blood-brain barrier, which is important to know this, uh, we, we, we did this study uh, a number of years ago, and we actually looked at the stereoisomers of SAMI, both in, uh, in, in plasma um, and CSF, but these are results that are in CSF. And this is the inactive isomer, this is the active isomer of SAMI. So this isomer here cannot be metabolized enzymatically, but this one can. And pharmaceutical preparations of SAMI contain about 25% of the inactive isomer. It's a spontaneous reaction that occurs. Now this is important because it's been suggested that SAMI is metabolized to methionine and then it's the methionine that gets taken up and that's what leads to the increase <coughs> excuse me, in SAMI in the brain tissue. However, we know that even the inactive isomer, which does not get metabolized, can pass across the blood-brain barrier, shown by the increase that we have here. So we know that a molecule does get across cells. May not get across very well, but it does get across. And may have to give high doses too. This was um, 800 milligrams a day intravenously for 14 days. As we had the ability to um, do GS8 
GSH assays and had the samples, the spinal fluid from, from these uh, patients. We also measured GS and plasma. We also measured GSH levels in these HIV infected patients. And we could confirm previous reports that GSH is significantly reduced or significantly lower in HIV patients compared to controls. Uh, what we also showed, and I think this is the only report, according to my knowledge, uh, that I've seen, the only uh, publication, uh, I haven't seen any other publications that have actually shown GSH to be decreased in the spinal fluid from HIV-infected patients. So there, there is an actual GSH deficiency uh, in the CNS of, in, in HIV-infected patients. And once we looked, found that, we wanted to see if uh, giving SAMI would actually restore the GSH levels to any extent. And it did, to some extent, increase in every single patient. This is a subset of our previous, uh, of this previous slide. Uh, six patients here received uh, SAMI before and after treatment and um, uh, received SAMI and we took spinal fluid before and after treatment. It was a significant increase. And that's important because this actually shows that SAMI can increase CNS levels of uh, GSH, and this is total GSH. In looking through the literature, I wanted to see if there was any other studies that could show that GSH levels could be increased in the central nervous system uh, after administering SAMI, and this is the only publication I've found. Um, and these, uh, these authors have actually looked at, the, um, at chronic treatment over 22 months, groups of rats, and they've looked at um, both uh, T-bars, thiobutyric uh, acid reactive substances, a measure of uh, oxidative stress in the membranes. Uh, it does increase with age, but if you give SAMI, uh, it suppress it or it, it pr protects against that oxidative stress that we see here. And if we look at the GSH levels, um, they are significantly increased in the animals that had, uh, this is total GSH, significantly increased at every age in the animals that had rece received SAM treatment. And this is actually quite a low dose, 10 milligrams per kilogram per day is actually a comparatively low dose, relatively low dose of, of SAMI that was given. Um, this is from the same group who looked at the effect of incubating forebrain tissue with various concentrations of SAM, SAMI, and they looked at various uh, enzymes involved in uh, GSH metabolism, and it's at these higher doses that we see uh, a significant increase, indicating that there is some effect of SAMI on the uh, synthetic, uh, biosynthetic uh, machinery of, for GSH metabolism. Regarding SAMI in liver disease, it's been known for a long time, uh, since the early 1980s, that cirrhotic patients have an inability or an inability to handle methionine uh, as well as uh, control subjects. If you give an oral dose of methionine, 50 milligrams per kilogram, to cirrhotic patients, their methionine levels remain elevated, they cannot metabolize the methionine as well as the controls indicated here. And if we look at the exc excretion of sulfate, so this is the methionine that's going through methylation, then through to transsulfuration and the excretion of urinary sulfate, in the cirrhotic patients it's very much reduced compared to the controls. So methionine levels are maintained high, it's not able to go through to the transsulfuration pathway. There's a an inability here to, to handle methionine. And in fact, recently we've been able to um, look at a group of uh, patients with chronic liver disease, all had cirrhosis. Um, many of them, most of them actually had, um, were due to uh, uh, alcohol uh, toxicity. Uh, they're all alcoholic, actually, and, and, and most of them also, oh, many of them, excuse me, approximately 50% of them had hepatitis C as well. But what we see here is that there is a, a large accumulation of methionine in the serum. Uh, again, an inability to handle the methionine. 
They also have high levels of homocysteine, which uh, back up. And they also have uh, low levels. Many of them have low levels of uh, glutathione in the serum. And we don't really need statistics to see that or to show that the significant differences between the cirrhotic patients and the, and the normal subjects. The elevation in homocysteine may also be due to the effect of uh, alcohol on folate enzymes and on, on vitamin B6 as well. Um, other studies have shown that alcoholics are typically uh, can be folate deficient and, and B6 deficient, which can affect the homocysteine levels. But this does indicate a block in the methylation pathway and the transsulfuration pathway and indicated clearly here by GSH deficiency. The GSH deficiency has been reported by other people. We're obviously not the first to um, report that. But I'd like to give you some kind of uh, reason and go into it, this a bit more, why um, there is this impairment and why SAM may be good for, or SAMI may be good for the treatment of liver disease. SAMI is synthesized by um, methionine adenosyl transferase, of which there are three forms. Uh, MAT1 and MAT3 are expressed only in the liver by the MAT1A, G, uh, MAT1A gene. And there is a low KM and a high KM for these two uh, enzymes. Now, MAT2 is expressed in non-hepatic tissues, all other tissues in the body. Um, and that's under a, 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 a controlled by a different gene, uh, the, totally under different genetic regulation. Um, now, in, in the cirrhotic patients, we see a high level of methionine, and what I'll show you is that it's actually due to an inability or uh, a reduced activity of MAT1, MAT3. This was shown by um, Jose Mato's group in Spain uh, a number of years ago, where they looked at MAT activity, hepatic MAT activity, and showed that it was 50% lower in cirrhotic patients and it didn't matter if they were alcoholic or even post-hepatitic. Um, there was no difference between the two. They were, it was just l low in, in cirrhotic patients by 50%. The SAMI levels were also decreased by approximately 50% and phospholipid methylation was also decreased in these patients. We know now from more recent studies by the same group, these are all from the same, from the same laboratory, that hydrogen peroxide and hydroxyl radicals can lead to uh, inactivation of both MAT1 and MAT3. And also what is very nice is that GSH can actually activate MAT1 and MAT3, the hepatic enzyme. Now this is, this is important because this has implications in, in most diseases where there is oxidative stress, where generation of free radicals occur or where GSH deficiency occurs. <clears throat> we also know that um, nitric oxide inactivates the uh, hepatic MAT and this is for MAT1 uh, and uh, uh, this is for MAT1 here and this is for uh, so and this uh, this is the activity of MAT1 plotted against the amount of um, nitrosylation that occurs. If you uh, incubate hepatic MAT1 or MAT3 with uh, GSNO, nitrosoglutathione, which causes nitrosylation of the uh, protein of the enzyme, it causes a marked inactivation of the enzyme for both MAT1 MAT and MAT3. To summarize these um, observations, Increase, uh, the increased nitric, so nitric oxide that's produced in the liver, and this can occur during septic shock or, a, or a hypoxia, has been associated with the inactivation of hepatic MAT. And, and you can actually prevent this by giving a nitrous oxide synthetase inhibitor, NAM, and this decreases that hepatic MAT inactivation in response to the hypoxia. Now, we know that this can occur because by a mechanism that involves uh, the interaction of GSH with cysteine residues. MAT, the MAT subunit contains 10 cysteine residues and if you mutate, if you create a mutation which replaces cysteine-129 by serine, this protects the liver MAT from inactivation. If you do this to any of the other nines, 
nine cysteine residues, it doesn't affect it. It's only at this cysteine 121. Uh, it is. Actually, the MAT1 is a, is a dimer, and MAT3 is a tetramer. And this occurs, this cysteine 121 causes, uh, when you have GSH that can, if you have nitrosylation of that cysteine residue, <coughs> it produces a conformational change which actually alters the binding site and inactivates, causes inactivation of the MAT uh, enzyme. Um, you, you can because um, if you add, this can be reversed by um, physiological amounts of GSH. Um, just to summarize this again, um, GSH deficiency can cause inhibition of MAT1 and 3 uh, by direct violation and also hydroxyl radicals uh, can, can inactivate the enzyme as well as the nitrosylation, increased nitrosylation. Now in septic shock, this may be a, a mechanism for, it has been proposed, this may be a mechanism for um, preserving ATP because this would conserve ATP. However, in, in liver disease where GSH is very low, where there is oxidative stress and there's probably nitric oxide being produced, um, we're seeing an inactivation of the MAT, an increase in the methionine, and a decrease in the SAM. And there is a decrease in the methylation reactions as well, in the phospholipid methylation. That's markedly decreased in, 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 uh, in hepatic conditions. Um, I want to show you some data that, sh that, that indicates that given SAM, exogenous administration of SAMe can restore GSH levels, at least partially, at least increase them to some extent. <clears throat> this was a study that was done back in 1989 where they um, administered patients uh, with oral SAMe quite high dose, 1,200 milligrams a day. And this was uh, uh, oral SAMe for six months. And they showed that um, in both non-alcoholic liver disease patients and alcoholic liver disease patients receiving SAMe, the level of glutathione in um, liver biopsies was actually in liver tissue was actually increased post-treatment. This was one of the first studies that actually showed that SAMI could be used as a glutathione project. Another study was uh, reported in 1994. They looked at cirrhotic alcoholics <coughs> administered very high dose here, two grams intravenously for 15 days and showed an increase in red blood cell glutathione uh, which was reduced in a, in, a, in a cirrhotic alcoholics, as we would expect, versus the non-cirrhotic non patients. But uh, on placebo, there was no difference. But on SAM, after SAMI treatment, you see a significant increase. Other animal models have shown similar results, um, particularly with cyclosporine A, a uh, immunosuppressive drug, which can cause uh, intrahepatic biliary cholestasis and also hepatotoxicity. In rats that have been treated with cyclosporin A, the uh, concentration of GSH is markedly reduced, and you can prevent this by co-administration of SAMe. Also able to show in this, these authors were able to show that malondialdehyde levels were actually increased in, uh, uh, in the cyclosporin A group at were normalized when given the SAMI co-administered. Another animal model is, uh, is this well-known uh, paracetamol Tylenol compound which can deplete liver stores of GSH. And again, um, in this study, two different concentrations have uh, looked at, two different concentrations of SAMI have been used to uh, reverse and protect against the paracetamol-induced GSH depletion. Uh, another piece of evidence that I'd like to uh, show you is that um, this is again actually from the same group, Jose Mata's group in Spain, 
where they looked at uh, GSH transport in mitochondria. And this is a GSH, uh, mitochondria cannot synthesize a GSH. They have to transport it into, this, in, into that organelle. And ethanol uh, blocks the transport or in, in impedes that, that, that transport of GSH into the organelles itself. Um, however, if, you, if the uh, ethanol-fed animals are also administered SAM, SAM-E, you can restore some of that uptake. And this was done in, in situations where um, an ATP regenerating system was present, uh, was present or absent. Um, when it was present, you can see the effect here quite, that the effect of SAMI in restoring GSH transport in, in the ethanol-fed animals. <clears throat> this is an observation that um, is quite important, they, they, I, I would think, because if you look at the intracellular GSH concentration in, in, in the mitochondria of these animals, this occurred um, only with uh, the SAMI, but not with the NAC, when, when animals were supplemented with NAC. And this was where the SAMI was supplemented in a liquid diet at one micromole per meal. Pardon? Um, they, they don't actually know what the mechanism is on this, uh, although in this publication here, if you, if, you look at, if you look at this, I've got a copy, I can give it to you. It's interesting because they've shown that there's changes in the membrane, uh, in the mitochondrial membrane, in the anisotropy of the membrane. It's actually, uh, they believe there may be a, a change which has been induced that makes the membrane more fluid. Maybe through a methylation process might be acting there, which is a completely different mechanism from it restoring a GSH, just from restoring, and that's why we see this difference between the NAC. The principal transporter is a dicarboxylate carrier that functions in normal mitochondrial uh, transport of uh, Krebs cycle intermediates, right. and there's a secondary transporter that's the uh, ox two oxoglutarate transporter. That's what takes glutathione in. Yeah. yeah. And it could be that even the, the transporter may be methylated and uh, yeah, produces a different change there that could facilitate it. Hmm. Um, they, they've used, they, they quote, actually they, they've um, also measured ethanol levels in the plasma and there was no difference in, in, in you know, the NAC or the SAMI did not alter the levels of ethanol in the blood. Um, they were the same throughout the, all these groups. Um, I imagine they were pretty happy. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, that was a rat study. Um, what, what does all this biochemical data mean? Um, uh, that question came up yesterday as well. You know, you can have all these biochemical endpoints, but in terms of patients, what does you know what, what good does it do to have um, all these significant changes, reverses, uh, reversal in, in uh, metabolite levels that were altered in the first place? But I, I want to point out this publication. Uh, that was uh, produced in 1999, published in 1999, where they uh, gave SAMe 1,200 milligrams daily to um, alcoholic cirrhotic patients. And they looked at the survival of these patients over a two-year period. And survival is defined as time of death or time of transplant. And you can see that the uh, patients that received the SAMe uh, Many more of them survived uh, than those in the, in, who received just a placebo, and a difference was significant. And these, these were. If they the time of death or transplant, then they're, they're, can you really love those? Well, I, I'm, I'm not a gastroenterologist. Actually, I'm a neurochemist, so I don't really know if you can. Well, it, it, I wouldn't think it is because if you don't give them the transplant, they will die. You cannot let them die. Well, I, I agree with that, but the, the, the issue essentially is the transplant is defined 
identify what the delivery is available and whether we see. I mean, there's whole lots of reasons yeah. for the way people decide on transplants. So no, it's, it's if they. No, it's if they it's if they actually need the transplant. I mean, whether you know they they, they would even die or they would they would get that transplant. Yeah, so, well, that, but that's such a very short period that but that we're talking about. Um, Yeah, they, they may have different medical practices there in Spain, which uh, actually I know they do. I know they do. Yeah. Many more Spain, Spain is a place where there are many, many more transplants because organ donation is part of the culture. Yeah. And it's but probably not, not as a problem here. Yeah. Um, perhaps I'll just summarize uh, what, I've, what I've presented to you and that. <clears throat> SAMI can be common in various neurological disorders, and I haven't really spoken about that much today. I've really just focused a little bit on, on the HIV and its potential there um, in, in HIV infection. Um, obviously, it's, it's, it's prevalent in, in liver disease. SAMI deficient is prevalent in liver disease. And that exogenously administered SAM can actually enter into endogenous pools and be metabolized through the methylation and transsulfuration pathways. And also that SAMI has been able to restore um, GSH levels in, in humans and various animal models. And, and that's where the evidence that we, we really have that G SAMI acts as a GSH prodrug. Um, hepatic GSH levels can regulate the activity of MAT1 free and, and therefore the metabolism of finding and SAM through these methylation and transsulfuration pathways. And that will be interesting to look at um, and that may also be the mechanism in, in, in HIV infection. Uh, we, really, we really don't know what the mechanism of, of SAMI depletion is in HIV infection, whether it is because of a, a reduced uh, GSH and increased oxidative stress and its effect on, on hepatic uh, MAT and, and therefore the synthesis of SAM. And that long-term treatment with SAMI did increase, at least in this study, which was one of the, one of the first ones to look at that. And there, there is another study proposed similar to that to be done here in the United States. Um, it did increase the survival time in alcoholic cirrhotic patients. Can I ask sir, again, so does MAC also use in some studies of, uh, for a cirrhosis? I, I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at NAC in, in, in cirrhosis. Well, the rationale was there to use SAMI because there is this vast amount of evidence in the literature that Cirrhotic, cirrhotic patients have a decreased hepatic MAP, uh, decreased SAM levels, and, 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 they, and they have decreased glutathione. And, it, and also, they could show specifically that phospholipid methylation, the PEPC ratio in uh, membranes from uh, hepatocytes, uh, were, were, is defective. I was at a meeting that was several years ago. Maybe you were there, too, uh, in, in Granada, Spain. Uh, in which, which was sponsored very much by uh, a SAMI group, and it was a SAMI company. Yeah, say, yeah. And NAC was ruled out because SAMI was the thing that was being, being pushed. And I just wonder whether that's what led to this study, and n nobody's ever, you know, made, made NAC uh, available for a study for mm -hmm. cirrhosis. Yeah. Um the studies in liver disease really took off more when an oral form was available. And unless you've got a good oral form of NAC available to do chronic studies, then, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to... But Europe. there's a difference. Uh, SAMI is partially, at least, <laughs> patented. Speak louder, yes. Taylor. Yes, therefore, it can be financed. Oh, the SAMI has got a patent which NAC doesn't have... Probably a, a manufacturing that. patent. <coughs> well, that's probably a major incentive. Yes. <laughs> Okay, I, I'll, put, I'll put up this slide here, and it, this may provoke more, more, um, more uh, questions, which you know, is fine. Um, and, and this has come because I know, Lee, that you, you know, you're very interested in this. Yeah. When you were at the meeting at the NIH, they also talked about SAMI with respect to the deposition of the fibrotic tissue. 
and fibrosis. But could, did you, um, you, didn't, you didn't have a slide on that, but could you amplify on that? Um, uh, yeah, Shirley Liu is doing that work. I, I don't know too much about that. There is some, uh, she believes that also the increase in homocysteine might have something to do with that. Um, we're actually trying to look at that in, in some animal models of, and, and animals which are ma made hyperhomocysteinemic to look at fibrosis there. And, um, but, you know, in, in those, GSH is probably going to be down as well. Um, it's actually difficult to work out, you know, wh which metabolite is actually responsible, whether a GSH or a SAMe is, is, you know, causing the fibrosis or homocysteine. There isn't a, a liver expert here. Is there? Gabe's, no. Gabe is not here now. Gabe will be here later if you just the clinic today. Yeah. Well, I, I mean... I'm sorry, I lost that question. What was that question? Um, Lee was asking whether... Uh, you know, what role does SAMI deficiency play in, in causing liver fibrosis? And, and, uh, and, and that would, it would really need to do, you know, they need to do more clinical trials to look at fibrosis um, after treatment, really. And, and, and that's, that, that will get done. And there is a trial being planned at U uh, University of Southern California to uh, to look at SAMI treatment in, in, in liver disease and, and look at fibrosis. Well, the, the sub theme, which is also, I mean, I was asked by <coughs> a couple of people, you know, should, uh, <coughs> what's the difference of giving NAC and giving SAMI? And uh, can you re refer to that more generally? Well, what we don't know is, um, and it would be nice to look at to see if uh, NAC can um, restore. SAMI levels in, in, uh, in animal models where um, SAMI is made deficient. I mean, even in, in, in paracetamol toxicity, SAMI, SAMI levels decrease as well. Um, and that's because the GSH level is down. Um, there's an actual uh, inhibition because of, of the MAT activity. And, yeah, you know, it would be nice to do co-administrative studies to see if, if these two compounds work synergistically um, in, in elevating glutathione and restoring the balance. Could they act alternatively? Or? Where one is with the equivalent to the other appropriate level, appropriate doses. That's the question. <coughs> okay. You know, we don't have a firm answer on that, but I don't know. No, I, I don't think. Okay. But before you rush to the door, to buy a Sammy tablets <laughs> because it's Friday night and you're going to drink some wine. Which, which, which one of these do you sell? I don't sell any of them. <laughs> um, I wish I did. <laughs> uh, but there are a number of them that are on the market and some of these have gone and others have come. And, and it, it is uh, confusing and it's a real question of buyer beware because we took these compounds, uh, these products, and we analyzed them for SAMI content. And this is what we found. <laughs> and um, this is percent of label claim. Uh, so we have here SAMI content 100% up here. Um, they come basically in two forms. And the two yellow bars are in a butane disulfonate form. The other forms are in a toluene sulfonate form. <coughs> this butane disulfonate is claimed to have the, claims to have the uh, longest shelf life. And in fact, <coughs> is the only one that there is data on file to have a three-year shelf life. <coughs> the stability of the other forms, uh, products, is a little questionable because we don't know if there wasn't any in there to begin with or if it decayed over time. <laughs> and that's a big question. And that's a big problem because if it is a, over time, it's, it's actually easier to handle the one if they couldn't be bothered to put it in because they're making a quick buck and that's it. Because you just get rid of them and they go away if you can. But if it's over time, then what do you do? Do you, how do you, you know, you can't stockpile this in your medicine cabinet. And nobody's been advised on that either. We are testing, doing longitudinal studies to see uh, three, six months. This was actually done. We're due to do a six month study and see if we turn up uh, a decrease over time a long, in a longitudinal study. 
but, but there is um, a big concern. And that actually will cause problems because if people start to use these two products down here and they don't have any effect, then they're going to think that the molecule isn't working and then that's just going to feed back and create more problems. That's a good question. There, there are um, one or two manufacturers, uh, and, but then it depends on if they supply the tablet already prepared in a, in, a, in a good way, in a good form, or if they're supplying the raw product and then somebody else is putting it into a tablet and doesn't know how to handle the material. The SAMI is a natural product. It cannot be patented, but what's patented is its stability. And you have to know how to handle it in order to keep it uh, in, in the tablet in a, in a good condition. It has to be protected from humidity, enteric coated is better, um, that kind of thing. So just for, for clarification, most of us don't know, I don't think. So the FDA certainly doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, look at the level, the amount of no. SAMI. There is no, what about the, was it the OTC uh, and that, no, the, uh, FTC. the Trade Commission? Doesn't that, does <coughs> not look at the levels of uh, that, that has clay? been brought to their attention, but they are so swamped, I guess, and uh, it will take time before they, they jump on, on whoever is, uh, you know, whoever, some, of, some of the manufacturers that produce 0%. Um, you know, it's... it's uh, in Europe? In Europe, in, in Europe it's, it's very well controlled. In Europe, this is the product that's available in Europe, and um, that's, that's uh, made you know, to GMP standards and uh, it's for the prescription market and they have to pass regulations that are equivalent to the FDA here that are required for pharmaceuticals in the United States. The FDA here was not given jurisdiction to it over, over the counter Well, the FDA molecules. does monitor it, but it's the, 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 the question... Yeah, they, they regulate, but not in the same way as in... Uh, as they regulate uh, pharmaceutical drugs, yes. or pharmaceutical yes. products. They are not sold with an uh, indication. Right. They are just sold yeah. as a chemical, so therefore there is no, no, no legal control. And, and this is not <coughs> confined to this product. This is prevalent throughout the whole of the dietary supplement industry. But now we're dealing with a compound with which, like Sammy, which has therapeutic potential, is used as a prescription drug in other countries in European countries, it's entered the US market as a dietary supplement and there are other people, manufacturers who are coming in under the DSHEA regulations, Dietary Health Supplemental Education Act, getting it in as a, nutri nutraceutical, as a nutrient and don't have to answer to the FDA for content. So that's a big concern. Yeah, this, yeah, the subtle difference there is that when they passed that law, I think it was 92 and then modified 94, 95, somewhere around mm -hmm. there, if you're, if, you're, if you're providing it for health maintenance or health promotion type of function as opposed to a treatment of a disease, you can market it this way. But as soon as you cross that line and say it's effective for treatment of, then it goes into the jurisdiction of the FDA, as I understand it. So, so these are basically marketed for health maintenance or, or health promotion. <coughs> no, no health claims can be made. Right. Yeah. No, no That's why if you see, you never see depression. You see um, mood enhancing. Or you don't see osteoarthritis. You see joint health. If, if you look at that, that you go through the same problem. And there you have contaminants that are important, uh, pharmacologically active. So if you're really dealing, if you were to put that up, you would have two lines, one of which is how much NAC is actually there. Yeah. The second one is how, how much pharmacologically active you have it. And that was kind of the origin of how this whole meeting got started, because we went to David, who ultimately put on the market the, in the United States the European variety of the NAC, which doesn't have the contaminants. It's properly packaged. The same way. It's the same story. Nature made this, has done the same thing here for, for the, these products. And I don't think that anybody realizes that problem that exists. No. Okay, well, 
the, the question was what toxic contaminants might be left and actually we could we can pick up adenosine which I was concerned about because if it broke down to adenosine that's um, a hypertensive and that could be potentially very bad um, we, we didn't pick up anything in these products except for one where SAMI eludes at 14 minutes on a HPLC and at 22 minutes we saw a huge peak which equated to 200 milligrams of something and I don't know what it is um, and I, 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 you know, it, that, that's really scary. It's, we don't, we know it's not SAH, and we know it's not adenosine, and we know it's not methyl thioadenosine, which is also another breakdown product that can occur. So whatever they put in there to fill it out. <laughs> you have a question? Are there any other people? Maybe the last question. Do you have any experience with MSM, another food supplement? I, I don't actually, but I, I know that they. They provide sulfate sulfate groups. Over here. My HIV patients and start wiping out their poor form of things. How it did? That's interesting. And also made it easier for them to tolerate their uh, meds without nausea. Yeah. Then my boss took it away because we're in cross containment. They didn't want to spend ten cents a day for it. So, so there's, one, there's, end on. there's one more question, I think, from Rick. Sorry. Is, Matt, is Matt, too, a, a key player in uh, redox uh, modulation in the other cells, and is it um, affected by uh, oxidative stress and uh, nitrosylation like Matt 1 and Matt 3? They're, st they're starting to look at that now because most of this work on, on the MAT1 free and the hydroxyl radicals and nitrosylation that's been done has been done last um, couple of years. It's just been published. And they're starting to look at the MAT2 if it behaves in the same way. We, we, we don't know at the moment. But the fact that MAT1 free is, in a, is, is, is specific to the liver and that the liver is the biggest um, producer of GSH and probably plays a major role in inter-organ GSH bioavailability, as you know, Dean showed in his slide. Um, the fact that you, know, you can block that MAT1 free by low GSH or hydroxyl radicals can impact, I would think, on on the plasma levels and other uh, organs. Thanks.